Foundation and anchor designs provided their own unique problems due to the vastly varying soils conditions. Ian Bruce of Bruce Geotechnical Consultants of Vancouver directed soils testing and assisted in formulating the required designs. Local crews, under Australian supervision, prepared the tower sites. Heavy lift helicopters of Papua New Guinea were commissioned to supply helicopter services and the machine identified to lift the towers was a Russian Kamov KA-32, which was initially manned entirely by a Russian crew. Because of their inexperience in this type of operation, and in anticipation of a communication problem, permission was sought and subsequently granted for an American pilot, Captain Ken Twing, to operate the helicopter with a Russian as co-pilot. Once everything was completely ready, the job everyone had worked so hard to prepare for finally began. We started out in the hallway yard and started setting the towers from that side, emptied that yard, did a portion of the other yard, and then terminated the uh, erection at that point, actually because of the fact that we had overrun the foundation contractor. We couldn't go any further. We had no additional foundations in front of us. The concept for the towers is actually very, very simple. They're designed with a hole in the base of the tower and the four guys on the conventional mast. The tower is then picked up in the helicopter yard from the top of the bridge. You've already designed a, uh, a crossbar with two separate hooks that attach to the helicopter. Crews grab the hooks take them over to the tower, install them on the tower, and the pilot starts picking up the tower. He just gently picks up the tower from the one end, standing it onto the, the butt end, then picks it straight up vertically and flies it out to the particular crew. The crew, upon receiving the tower, again, make sure that they have, they are, this is all done through radio control. They then have the pilot bring it in close to them, again come down, set it onto the ground away from the foundation, discharge the static electricity, then a few of the crew members will, uh, will take hold of the base of the tower. They then bring it in to the pin that's sticking up out of the foundation and set it on that pin. This is where it becomes very, very critical with the ver vertical reference flying capabilities of the pilot. He sets it on that pin. The crew is then splitting off the four guy wires, which have been just temporarily tied up onto the mast so they'll stay clear of the crew when they're coming in. He then leans it in a longitudinal plane, either back on the right of way or ahead on the right of way, to give them slack in those two particular guys. Those two guy wires are then walked out manually to the particular guys, to the particular anchors, I'm sorry. They're installed through the anchors and gripped off. There's a standard hand signal that then exists between the man that's attaching the uh, guy wire onto the anchor and the main radio control man, who is the only man that's in radio contact with the pilot. Both of the crews that have received those guys signal back that they have it attached. He then pulls it up tight against those anchors, leans it as much as he can in the other direction. Those two crews go out, only leaving one man back on each of the previous anchors. The other two men come ahead to help out. They go ahead with the anchors, repeat the very same thing, signal back. The radio man confirms that he's got confirmation from all four anchors that everything's fine to release. He then instructs the pilot to release. The pilot comes down gently till he gets some slack in his lines that are onto the hooks and releases the hooks. He's now finished from the tower and flies away. Sanity then returns and you can hear yourself think and everybody finally gets a chance to talk to one another. Everything is 100% by hand signals while the chopper is hovering over you because there's absolutely no, no capability to speak at that point in time. After having received the tower, the crew then bundles up all of their tools into a container that they have on site. By this time, one of the 206s is already hovering above them to pick up the tools, move the tools to their, their next designated tower site. 
The crew then moves away from the tower site to a spot where one of the other helicopters can be picking them up and moving them to the site. Meanwhile, a large KA-32 has gone to the second crew and is flying the tower into them. By the time he's done that, return to the yard, your first crew is now set and ready to receive their second tower. So it's a continual ongoing operation, unless stopped by weather or stopped by um, a problem with the helicopter uh, stopping for fuel, this type of thing. When the towers are first received, as I've uh, just discussed, and the crew is moving on to the second tower site, the tower has not been plumbed or leveled, if you like. Uh, the reason for this, and the reason it's left in a temporary basis, is to optimize the use of the KA-32 helicopter, which is the most expensive machine you have on site. So you set as many towers as you can per day, and then come back and do your leveling as a separate operation after the KA-32 has returned back to Mount Hagen. Once a significant number of towers had been erected, the stringing operation began. Another very unique aspect of the project, which again was addressed at the, during the methodology report, was the stringing or the installation of the conductors. Uh, bearing in mind that absolutely everything had to be moved by helicopter. So all of the stringing equipment, the puller, the tensioner, uh, all of the reel stands, everything had to be transportable by helicopter. Even the purchasing of the conductor had to be purchased in much shorter lengths than we would normally be accustomed to here in North America in order to, to be allowed to be flown at the type of altitudes we were at.